Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you today to our webinar on understanding the threat of radicalization from a gender-based perspective, a case of Bangladesh. As you don't know that terrorism and radicalization is coming in different manifestation and a new angle of the threat that we are facing now is coming from female radicalization. This is a new aspect that has been coming and visiting many countries, including Bangladesh, and the threat, I'm afraid, is increasing. BIPS has been studying the subject for some time in depth, and we have done several studies, conferences, papers on this aspect. I'm also happy to welcome our partners from IFES, with whom we are working and col collaborating on a number of research issues and on a number of events. And now today's event is also one of those events in which we are cooperating and co collaborating with IFES. I'm also happy to welcome Celia, who represents IFES, and I understand Celia is currently based in Finland. Hi, Celia. Hi. So many of our research work has been published. You can come to our website to see that. Uh, today's presentation will be made by one of the members of our research team, Ms. Marzuka Binte Afzal. She has extensively studied the subject and published on it, and I'm show that he'll be, she'll be presenting some interesting findings from her from our research so far. Uh, today's deliberations on the webinar will be moderated by Mr. Shafkat Munir, who is research fellow at BIPS and also the head of Bangladesh Center for Terrorism Research, which is a sister unit of BIPS. With that very brief introduction, I shall now hand over to Celia for a few words before it goes back to the moderator for conduct of the webinar. Thank you all very much for coming to the webinar today, and I hope you enjoy the discussions that is coming forth. Thank you. Thank you, and salam alaikum. Thank you so much, General Munir Azman, for the kind introduction. And uh, my name is Celia Pasolina. I'm with the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. And normally I am based in Colombo, Sri Lanka, but currently I am actually in Sweden. I had to change from my home country of Finland to Sweden for very complicated reasons recently. So greetings from Sweden. Um, and, uh, but I, I remember very well um, discussions that we've had with BIPs over the years on the issue of radicalization and terrorism in Bangladesh. I mean, I, I lived in Bangladesh for three years and that was during the time of holy, uh, the holy artisan bakery attack. Um, and, and that was a very difficult time for many of us. It actually happened just a few blocks away from my house and I still remember the, the counterterrorism operation that went on for 24 hours uh, in that location and, and it was very jarring. And I'm, I'm sure many of the people here have known people um, you know, who have been affected by terrorism. And I, I mean, I, I think we all have to some degree in, in many of the countries that we live in. And unfortunately, it's obviously not a Bangladeshi problem. This is a global problem. And, and we will continue to see efforts at radicalization, whether they be of the violent Islamist nature or whether they be a violent racist white supremacist nature, which is what's happening in my other home country of the United States. Uh, so uh, I think today's discussion will be very um, important because I know that ISIS has uh, had a conscious strategy to recruit more female um, participants in their cause. And so I'm really looking forward to Marjuka's presentation on this topic because the social isolation that it has been brought on by COVID has obviously um, had an impact on how people um, feel, feel cornered and maybe they feel isolated and hopeless. And so that has perhaps made things um, even more acute in terms of trying to 
a counter radicalization of women and men. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion today. And I really thank BIPS for this excellent cooperation that we've had for many years on, on this topic and others. Um, and I look forward to the, to the discussion today. And I'm, I'm really glad we're joined by many experts, um, much greater experts than myself um, today. So thank you. Yeah, Chef Kud, it's over to you now. Yeah. Um, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Yes. Great. Uh, Celia, thank you so much for your uh, welcome remarks. As you rightly said, uh, radicalization is a very serious challenge facing Bangladesh. And uh, we all remember the tragedy that befell us on uh, July 2016 with the Holy Bakery attack. But uh, we have, it is important to note that we have come a long way since then. And I think it's internationally recognized now the strides that Bangladesh has made in countering violent extremism, both from an operational and a strategic point of view. But one thing that I have always maintained in my own uh, remarks, in my writings and so on, and it's a view that is shared by, I'm sure shared by many, that the absence of a successful terrorist attack does not denote the absence of the threat of terrorism and violent extremism. So when we talk about the threat of violent extremism, it still remains quite substantial. And it is uh, not a challenge faced by Bangladesh alone, as you said, and as also mentioned by our President General Nisman. It is a challenge uh, shared by many countries across the globe. What we are seeing, particularly in the last two, three years, is that there is also now a gender aspect to this radicalization. Uh, but our understanding of radicalization sometimes, uh, in the case of Bangladesh, we uh, don't seem to properly grasp the complexities of the gender aspect of radicalization. And that's why at BIPS and BCTR, it has been our constant endeavor to uh, do extensive amount of research and analysis on this issue. In 2018, we actually did a major um, in the international conference on looking at the issue of female radicalization, but our research has been ongoing since then. So without further ado, I would request my colleague Marzuka Binti Afzal to make her presentation, and then we'll come back. Uh, we will have an open discussion where we can get into more depth on this issue. Marzuka, it's over to you. I apologize, everyone. We are having uh, some technical issues. It will take a couple of minutes to uh, get it organized. Uh, in the meantime, could I uh, request uh, our participants to kindly introduce themselves so we can get to know each other who's in the room? Uh, we will, uh, we've already had Celia. We'll start with uh, Colonel Khairul Hassan. Uh, Colonel Khairul Hassan, a retired Colonel of Bangladesh Army. At present, I'm, uh, I do some uh, writing, uh, uh, freelance writing, involved in some freelance writing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Masood Chaudhary. Uh, please unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Now you can hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm teaching at Independent University Bangladesh, media and communication, and doing research in the field of uh, CV and de-radicalization de process. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. We will now go to our IFS colleagues, uh, Head of Operations, Mr. Abu Tahir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Shafkat Bhai, and all the participants, and Celia, and distinguished guest, and Major General Manir Zaman, sir. So, uh, I'm really excited to experience this wonderful um, seminar, and I believe I'd be able to learn a lot from all the participants from their valuable feedback comments. So, from being IFES head of operation, looking forward to watch the full event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Abid Rahman. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Abid Rahman. I work at IFES as well. I'm a senior project manager uh, working with BIPS uh, on a regular basis. Hopefully, this event uh, becomes a 
in-person event soon and glad to be in this event overall. Thank you so much. Uh, Marzuka is back, so we'll just uh, do a uh, couple of more introductions, then we'll go to her and we'll come back to you again later. Mr. Parvez Abbasi. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Shafkat. Uh, I'm Parvez Kim Abbasi. I teach at East West University. I'm an economist by profession, and I do work on geoeconomics and geopolitical aspects. Happy to be here. Thank you. Professor Lalifa Yasmin. I just saw her a little while ago. Assalamu alaikum and good morning to everyone. Good afternoon, in fact. I just woke up, so for me, it's still a morning. Um, I'm, I'm also having an uh, electricity problem here in Bonani, and uh, as you can see, I'm losing my connection over and over again. And um, yeah, I'm a, I teach at the Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. Uh, my research area uh, varies, but uh, in this particular case, I work on violent extremism and its gender aspect. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yasmin. We, we appreciate your kind participation. And uh, we all recognize that there are lots of technical issues with webinars. Yeah, so yeah. that's not a problem. But thank you for being with us. We'd be very keen to hear your insights as well, given your uh, significant work in this area. Thank you for being with us. Um, for this round, we will just end with uh, Dr. Nadia Binti Amin. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I feel privileged to be here today. And actually, basically, I'm an entrepreneur, but I have a research firm. I work as managing director of research and computing services, private limited. And also, I work for different university as, as adjunct faculty. And also, I am a founder president of the Women Entrepreneur Network for Development Association. Thank you, everybody. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, hear with the, from all the distinguished uh, guests and speakers today. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Without further ado, uh, I would go to uh, Marsuka. Marsuka, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I am extremely sorry for the technical difficulty. I hope you can all hear me. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all. I am Marzuka Binte Afzal, a research intern at Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies. And I welcome you all to today's uh, webinar uh, on understanding the threat of radicalization from a gender based perspective uh, case of Bangladesh. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank our President Sir, uh, Major General Munuru Zaman, for giving me this opportunity to speak on behalf of our institute. I'd also like to thank uh, Celia Ma'am for uh, her uh, remarks uh, on today's concern. Thank you, Ma'am. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I thank you all, uh, respected participants, uh, for being here today as I launch to the keynote presentation. If you could kindly wait, I'm going to share the screen. <clears throat> Welcome back everyone and I'm um, sorry for the delay. As I was saying, uh, I'm going to launch into the keynote presentation now. In today's presentation, I will be discussing the following concerns. Trends of female radicalization in Bangladesh, imminent threat of female radicalization in a post-pandemic Bangladesh, countering female radicalization through a gendered lens and more. <clears throat> so let's get into it. Any phenomena that impacts a society affects all gender in some ways, the same way, and in many differently. Uh, but only one gender is predominantly represented. And when it comes to political violence, structural violence, extremism, terrorism, and other uh, such impacts, gen uh, it affects all genders, uh, like any other aspect of human civilization and society would. Men and women both uh, get affected, whether in different trends and manners, uh, they get affected same, in the same way or differently. These, are, these situations happen for several reasons. 
because while the overall output might be similar, the impact of it, the thought process of men and women are in, uh, and their, their being involved, their abilities, their constraints and behavior are often different. Hence, their decision making is also different. We often hear violence has a gender and that it is men, but that is not in the entire picture. A gendered interpretation of violence recognizes that politics, religion, state, society, and culture project, uh, uh, project the different uh, power and ability, uh, a result of which is that men occupy the dominant social status and position in politics, state, and society, while women are marginalized by men and are the subordinates. Men associated with masculinity are recognized as the perpetrators and active instigators of violent extremism with power, means, and capacity, as well as agency. But women are associated with femininity and are recognized as the passive actors influenced and forced into compliance by their dominant male counterpart and more often than not recognized as the victims of violence in all shapes and forms. But women are, don't always get coerced into radicalization and extremism. The choice, despite having drivers behind them, are often consciously made as they are try to attain some kind of social belongingness and security, as well as try to find a sense of identity in a world that perhaps makes them question it. Both kinds can be seen in several cases of female radicalization and violent extremism in Bangladesh, as well as in Bangladesh diaspora. Targeted women are either victims of coercion, or as we will now see, as we see more nowadays, uh, are looking to serve a higher purpose uh, in, for an afterlife, trying to find an identity, a purpose to live, and a feeling of belongingness. Women are no longer in, only victims, but propagators, plotters, and active extremists. If we have to discuss the evolution of female radicalization, we have to first talk about the evolution of Islamist terrorism in Bangladesh. And for that, we're going to move into our next concern, the waves of terrorism and female radicalization in Bangladesh. The wave theory is often used in discussing the different generations of terrorism in security studies. The religious extremism and terrorism hence can be divided into four basic waves. Their genesis, going back to the return of the veterans of the anti-Soviet struggle from the Afghan war in 1990s. The first wave started from the 1990s and continued till 2001. After the Afghan war, the veterans, now in connection with Al-Qaeda, felt the state was under the rule of Taguti forces. For those who do not know, Taguti forces, according to uh, one of the leaflets released earlier by JMB, meant non-Islamic. It basically means government forces who are aligned with the West. Then onwards began to brew the ideology of Al-Qaeda with the rise of AQ-inspired outlawed militant outfits such as Harkatul Jihad al-Islami Bangladesh, Hujibi, and later on um, Jamatul Mujahideen Bangladesh, JMB. Women in this wave were merely members of the families that the extremists belonged to. Moving on to the second wave, uh, it didn't last for very long. It was from 2001 till 2005. But during this time, JMB was in a lot, un un under a lot of power. Uh, they cast a wide net of terror, and particularly the, the pressure was felt in 2005 when simultaneously in over 300 locations all over the country, 500 bomb blasts took place. JMB thrived and became stronger, and falling under this pressure, the law enforcement began to catch the leaders of JMB, like Bangla Bhai, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, Siddiqur Rahman, Sani, and others. And these, there are about seven leaders got hanged in 2007. Women still in their sedentary roles maintained households, uh, and they got married to the members of the militants, um, uh, of the militant cells, and reared future militants uh, in, in uh, following under the same ideology. Moving on, uh, the third wave started uh, from then onwards and con continued till 2016. This tenure saw the growth of several terrorist group, groups like Hujibi and particularly the rise of Ansarullah Bangla team. From here, till, from 2013 to 2015, ABT 
came under a lot of attention uh, from the statesmen and from media, etc. Uh, particularly because of the multiple attacks on atheist bloggers, uh, journalists, scholars, and professors uh, that began to plague the country during that time. And then the fateful day of 1st June, July came, the attack in Holy Artisan Bakery took place. Here, however, we noticed a, a huge shift in the women's role in terrorism, uh, particularly uh, when we observed that the involvement of women increased. Women were no longer limited in their home, homes anymore, in, the, in their sedentary roles. They were brought out to work as recruiters of uh, radicalizing more women and youth, receiving and carrying important confidential messages to and from cells, carrying concealed weapons, and propagating narratives of these outfits. Salafi jihadist ideology began to accept women's participation in their so-called jihad. So because of that, the ISIS-inspired terror outfits began to adapt it as well. And then from uh, uh, past the holy artisan attack in 2016, we get to the present time where the fourth wave continued. During this time, uh, we have seen that women, are, the targeted women are turning out to be more well-educated and well-trained in information technology. Uh, during this time, uh, they began to take on more active roles in terror cells, uh, working as not only recruiters, but also recruiting people online through multiple identities in websites created uh, by the cells, creating online narratives based on terror ideologies, etc. They also acted as foot soldiers and suicide bombers. Here's a brief timeline that carries the major attacks throughout the all four waves that I've already discussed. As you can see, the yellow marked uh, ones are from the first wave, uh, the, which started basically from the Udichi uh, festival uh, uh, attack that took, took place in Kulna, as well as the attack at uh, Ahmadiyya Mosque. And carry, uh, the Muramna Botomul bombing by Hujibi also took place during that uh, wave. Then we have several bombings, such as in the shrine in Tangail and a, bomb, a bombing in Shah Jalal shrine as well. And the simultaneous bombing that I spoke about earlier, the uh, simultaneous 500 bombings in 300 locations of the country took place in the second wave. The third wave, of course, marks the rise of AB, uh, ABT and the attacks on, uh, on people like Muhyuddin Ahmed, Rajib Haider, and uh, uh, Sanyu Rahman, and the attack on Holly Artisan Bakery. And finally, we see an example here, the suicide bombing in Rap Camp in Dhaka, and the suicide bombing in uh, Hazrat Shah Jalal Airport, International Airport by ISIL and, uh, and Neo JMB as well. This timeline shows a major uh, representation of female terrorists. As you can see from the timeline here, uh, you will notice that most of these women are all caught during the time of fourth generation, which means that most of these women were either recruited in, in the third wave and must have carried on uh, developing their skills uh, in, uh, during this time and uh, uh, hence got caught in the fourth generation. As you can see, first we can see uh, Aklima Rahman. She's an, hard, she's an example of a hardened extremist who later on influenced two other uh, radica radicalists into becoming extremists like um, Meghna and Mo, as you can see here, who got caught by uh, the uh, agencies twice. We see Abitatul Fatima here as well. She's one of those examples of women who are well-educated and well-settled and financially independent as well, but still got coerced due to social stigma and because of fe the fear of be being abandoned by their husband into extremism. We see example of a lone wolf, uh, Mumena Shoma as well. And examples like Asmani Khatun and Shirina Khatun are the new examples of female leadership being developed in uh, Terror, uh, mil uh, outlawed mil uh, militant outfits such as new JMB. Moving on, let's talk about what drives women into female radicalization. While most of the drivers of radicalization work the same way for both men and women for social constructs and different constraints th which are gendered, the drivers impact women differently than they do uh, men. We're going to discuss four basic uh, drivers of female radicalization. They're social drivers, religious, psychological, and economic drivers. So let's get started. Social drivers are predominantly uh, 
uh, a fear of uh, women and they particularly uh, affect women because of these social constructs and constraints that are gendered in society which makes women quite dependent on men on their male counterpart for security agency and uh, their uh, their identity as well their uh, self respect in a lot of cases they are dependent economically as well because of which fear of being abandoned by husbands social stigma neglect vulnerability etc become weapons or of radicalization then again history of domestic violence and rape violence or revenge of a fallen brethren and or husband and feeling of be belonging in a sisterhood also influences them in these regards religious strivers mostly take effect due to the lack of religious knowledge and lack of religious identity as well as a deepened sense of religious sentiment in these regards uh, religious strivers can impact them to think about martyrdom or uh, getting reward in jannat or having a religious identity psychological drivers are perhaps the most important uh, drivers this that will be discussing in this uh, presentation which basically is the underlying driver of almost all the other um, uh, drivers of rad radicalization we can see that a lot of these uh, uh, issues such as identity crisis whether religious or social identity existential existential crisis feeling of belongingness to a certain group such as a sisterhood or being accepted in a social circle or having fellow feelings towards the cell these kind of feelings as well as uh, feelings of uh, going for an adventure or romanticism and suffering from frustration can trigger people in uh, women into getting into a, a radicalized group and finally economic drivers are basically the same uh, if financially dependent dependent on a husband or a male counterpart such as a father or a brother and not feeling empowered can impact women into becoming radicalized now that we know what the uh, drivers are we've briefly discussed it let's move on to the new trends we can see an increase in female radicalization uh, and female led terror units nowadays previously only taken into play roles of wives and sisters and taken to accompany in hijrat women are now becoming active role players even foot soldiers on the terror causes as we've discussed before uh, women are now participating more actively which leads to extremist groups relying more on women to gain strategic advantage recru recruiting them as a facilitator and martyrs while also benefiting from their subjugation and sophisticated outreach due to the technology gender specific interpretation of female suicide bombers in al qaeda as we've already seen uh, that is seen in media etc as we've also discussed uh, and we will further discuss it as well women in terrorism gain more media attention and become sensational news ensuring widespread of terror terrorist narrative and ideology family is a terror unit is a major concern particularly in bangladesh women easily are capable of recruiting men and women much better than their male counters uh, uh, male recruiters a radicalized woman in a family can thereby radicalize her husband and sons as as well and soon radicalize another woman in another family or in another society who can uh, in that result uh, radicalize her uh, husband and sons spreading terrorism terrorist ideology and narrative like a contagion and finally jihadi feminism it's not a major concern right now for us but it should be uh, something to consider because it could be an imminent threat soon women looking for understanding environment of sisterhood finding an uh, empowerment in violence that is justified by false and misinterpreted religious notions make them feel like they are doing something concrete to contribute to a society humanity and religion so why are women targeted why are women such desirable candidates for extremism women are suspected less women are still largely believed to be victims meek and too subordinate to actually be active participants in terrorism let alone be propagandists influencers and leaders they are checked less for concealed weapons and looked into less due to there not being enough female officers in security forces and law in, uh, enforcement agencies who can intervene them and check them for any hidden weapons or uh, suspect suspecting objects women are better recruiters who do not only recruit other potential female radicals 
but also recruit men better than male recruiters. Their presence online is better. Reading the target's mindset and enticing them, inspiring and manipulating them more than their male counterpart. And this is one of the things that women are better at. Female extremists and suicide bombers create more sensational news, as I've already said. They make better headlines than male extremists do, making them perfect candidates to spread the message and ideologies of militant outfits. More eyes means more views, means the faster the message and ideology of the uh, terrorist organizations spread. Women want to get empowered and become active participants to create a better society based on religion and equality makes them susceptible to radicalization by terror outfits like Ansar al-Islam, uh, AAI, or Neo JMB, which again, it falls into the uh, line of jihad feminism as I've discussed earlier. Moving on to talk about something that we're all worried about right now, the imminent threat of female radicalization in a post-COVID Bangladesh. While the world's attention befittingly con concentrates on the health and economic impacts of COVID-19, the threat of radicalization leading to a violent extremism persists still. While everybody is sitting at home and keeping safe, terrorism is still propagating. In some circumstances, it, it, it has aggravated during this crisis. The lockdowns, quarantines, and inactive time during the closure facilitate a few situations that create multiple grounds for the process of radi spreading radicalization. Young women and men are confined at home and surfing the internet unsupervised, while they come across radicalizing narratives from websites and social media, which is basically cyber radicalization. Women who are out of work are suffering from frustration and depression, sparking the need to divert their minds in causes that keep them active and can provide them with an alternative financial support or source. The rise of domestic and sexual violence, on the other hand, over the last few months since the pandemic started makes women further vulnerable to radicalization because they feel vulnerable and that they have nowhere else to go and they have no other choice. And when terrorist organizations offer them that kind of support and release from their uh, 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 violences, they accept it. Now to talk about a way forward, countering violent extremism and radicalization through a gendered lens. Women's participation in countering terrorism is more, uh, puts a more impactful uh, effect than they contribute when radicalized. Law enforcement agencies and security forces need to be more gender inclusive, hiring women to fill a certain quota till gender parity is ensured. Counter narrative messages should be targeted towards women as they are the singular impactful individual in a family, as we observed in the discussion of family as a terror unit. More emphasis need to be given to the psychological drivers of radicalization of both women and youth to properly understand how the social and economic roles come into play. There needs to be space on research on female radicalization and collaboration and transparency between security and terrorism researchers and law enforcement and counterterrorism units. Countering violent extremism, CVE, needs to be more a, of a wider dis, uh, study of discipline and uh, security studies and research needs to become more gender inclusive, encouraging women to participate and promote research. BEEPS has been involved in researching female radicalization and preventing violent extremism, as we know PVE, for a long time. Over their last, uh, one of their last successful uh, uh, such initiatives was the National Conference on Prevention of Violent Extremism from a Gendered Perspective. A conference report that you can find uh, was published following it. Emphasis should be given on strengthening social resilience to ensure safety and security for women against domestic violence, sexual violence, and discrimination. Empowering women of all spheres and economic background, providing better education, training, and religious teachings to enlighten and strengthen them can also be another solution. Religious institutes in this case can come very useful where they should have better approach at conveying correct religious teachings and proper interpretations of narr narrating, uh, which narrate uh, passages against terrorism. They should ensure people dignify women from a religious standpoint, promoting women's safety and empowerment and promoting uh, communal fellow feelings, etc. 
we've come to the end of the presentation. I thank you all for being so patient and kind with me and hearing me out. I give the floor back to uh, Shafkat Munir sir, uh, and I hear my, I end my uh, presentation here. Thank you all. Thank you, Marsuka. Uh, we appreciate your presentation. I will now open the floor for discussion. Uh, as you know, I can all imagine uh, that we, are, we had some technical difficulties, so I hope during the Q&A we won't have any further technical difficulties. But uh, in order, in the interest of time, I would request you to kindly raise your hand if you want to ask a question or put it in the chat box, which would be a bit easier. Then I can pick up the question from there. Um, let me start with a question from a me team member from BIPS. So we will first start with Feroz Ashrabi. My question to Marzuka would be, um, in your slides, you mentioned that women are not victims only, and they are in planning, uh, they are playing a role in the planning division as well. Can you give me an example where a woman was a part of a, a part of plotting and executing an attack in Bangladesh? Right. Uh, let me, Marzuka, let's hold for a little bit. We take a couple more questions and then we come back to you. Next question goes to Mr. Nadim Farhat from the United Nations Resident Coordinator's Office. Nadim? Yes, hi. Um, thank you, Shafkat, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, just a couple of points. I think one of the things is, um, in terms of the first one, the social resilience. I mean, I've been, I've been seeing in a lot of presentations, not only this one, but in a couple of other presentations too, that there is a lot of emphasis and discussion about social resilience while there has not been a sort of a, like a clear articulated structure as to how social resilience can be built so i was just wondering if there is any sort of concrete idea uh, in terms of how we can actually create that social area also another point that i had was uh, more from the attitude and the behavior perspective is i was wondering where do we see the shift in terms of attitude and behavior particularly in the period of COVID-19, uh, in looking at it from a very gender perspective. So those are my two specific questions or comments, whichever way you want to take it. Thank you. Right. Uh, next one goes to Abid Rahman from IFES. Abid? Sorry, I'm, I was muted. Uh, my question is, uh, when Marzuka said women are more powerful online while recruiting, what makes her get away with online profiles and messages to get away from getting caught by the law enforcement agencies? So basically, when she said it's, it's, it's easier for them to recruit, what are the m m methods or procedures they use to get away from law enforcement agencies? Thank you. Uh, we will come back to our participants again for the next round. Now over to Marzuka. Thank you, sir, uh, for giving me the floor once again. And thank you all for the uh, questions. They're very interesting indeed. Uh, I'll, I think I'll take the answers serially. First of all, uh, the question from Ms. Firoza Ashravi. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, well, yes, there are plenty of examples uh, that you can see from recent incidents uh, that represent women being in, in a more active role. Uh, not propagating but planning attacks. You can see the example of um, Humaira Nabila, for example. She was uh, arrested back in 2018. Uh, she was not only a plotter, but she also coerced her husband into getting, uh, a, a, becoming an extremist. And uh, her husband, in fact, got away with it uh, because he was not convinced of, to be, be an active uh, uh, extremi extremist in her I ideology, but she didn't. Uh, there are more examples such as uh, uh, Shirin, uh, uh, Shirin Khatun or Asmani Khatun. Asmani Khatun, for example, she's uh, a female uh, leader in a new, uh, uh, new neo JMB uh, uh, out, out, outfit of a cell. And she is known to have, have run her own uh, group of extremists, and she was known to plot and plan uh, the destruction of public properties, as well as monuments and different attacks as well, before she got app apprehended, of course. So there you go. There are a few examples. Uh, then uh, coming to the, uh, the question of Mr. Uh, Nahid Farhad, Nadim Farhad, uh, Farhad I'm, I apologize, uh, sir. Uh, thank you for your question. The first one where you asked about social resilience, I think 
social resilience when we talk about social re re resilience we mean uh, from we mean resilience from the root of everything there needs to be a strong source of counter narratives that focus more on making terrorism extremism and radicalization a negative idea there these can be given out into the society through numerous ways like such as uh, let's say advertisements or contents on online that you can show for example we, we've seen on in traffic uh, signals there are there, there are video feeds on different screens that show uh, videos against um, taking bribes and doing unlawful activities these narratives are or counter narratives as i've said so uh, create a social resilience in people's minds and besides there are other social gatherings such as let's say going to different uh, going to the uh, friday uh, uh, prayer uh, during uh, uh, to the jamaat in mosques you uh, the religious leaders there or or the uh, or, or 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 the leaders basically they can give a, a social resilient message against terrorism in this regard by social resilience basically we mean teaching our children in the, in the families particularly the idea against terrorism while we teach them other uh, the idea of uh, against uh, let's say drugs or alcoholism we can also teach them lessons again that they should not uh, go to cert learn certain things like ra being radicalized or being ter uh, uh, being terrorists or giving ideas against it by teaching them be better about morals and giving them better knowledge about religion and the other question that you asked about women being affected in uh, covid-19 basically we are all more or less affected uh, by radicalization during covid-19 the narratives online narratives of uh, the uh, ter terrorists are still out there and it's just so much that it's hardly people can hardly uh, uh, keep up with it uh, no, no matter how much you take down from the more come out and uh, take its place so these narratives are out there and every time you can easily come across them when you're surfing so women who are out of jobs right now and remain at home and are frustrated uh, uh, due to several reasons of not having any uh, uh, sustainable economic resource or sitting at home and being bored or wanting an adventure would easily get impacted by these uh, these kinds of narratives and of course while we don't see an exact um evidence of these effects taking in its place right now we have heard about it plenty and while we can still wait to see an actual effect of it post covid-19 i don't think we need to wait to see it happening in reality we should take the uh, measures right now while it's still you know uh, in in a latent uh, situation the next question i think i i'm sorry sir i missed your name you asked about how women are uh, the female radicals uh, are uh, getting away with, away with radicalizing uh, people online as i said before while our law enforcement agencies are trying their best level best to take down all these narratives out of the uh, social media new ones pop up all the time and uh, they are always infiltrating people they are widely available you will see online you can go and uh, check them out the people know where they are coming from and these messages are, are disguised in such manners that you can't really dif differentiate between the messages and you think that these are authentic but they're not which is an, are, and female radicalization particularly happens because women are easily uh, well this might sound crude but they're more better at manipulating and enticing men uh, particularly online they are good listeners so they talk about their personal matters their feelings their frustrations are shared and this creates a connection between the recruiters and the victim uh, and the uh, uh, the uh, candidate and thereby this is how they recruit uh, men particularly i hope that answers your questions Okay, thank you, Marzuka. Next round of questions. I would request all participants to keep their questions brief so that we have more time for discussion. Uh, we will do it in this manner. The first one would be Professor Lalitha Yasmin, followed by Mr. Pervez Karim Abbasi, followed by Faria Ulfat Lira, and then if we have time, we'll take one more question. Professor Lalitha Yasmin. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, marzuka this has been an excellent presentation because um, you have covered uh, the areas that often seem very uh, very you know unknown to us and ignored to us um, as i have worked in um, this area for quite some time i've seen that the law enforcement agencies and generally you know people in the society they think mm -hmm. they take 
women as peaceful and therefore uh, this uh, this idea that women have a uh, soft power and if we go back in history the last the, the point that you have mentioned that women are better at enticing women are better women do not need to use coercion every time to get their way um, so look at the story of the uh, story of adam and eve um, eve had a uh, soft power and that is how she made adam to eat the apple this is the very fact that we we often forget to go back at the genesis and look at um, how women are more powerful than men perhaps not physically all the time um, but uh, this soft power aspect is uh, continuously forgotten continuously overlooked and this is something i think we need to bring in the in the understanding of um, you know uh, violent extremism and women's role uh, in it and also um, another point that has been mentioned that uh, during the covid period uh, the joblessness uh, has increased but um, there has been a feminization of joblessness and there are uh, recent statistics says that um, uh, women have lost uh, more jobs in Bangladesh than men. And there has been, I think, um, if I'm not wrong, let me look at the uh, example, that uh, a study shows that 24% of women online entrepreneurs, uh, they had to shut down their businesses in June. So this is a huge number. And these women who are who already have the skills, uh, you know, uh, to, um, uh, you know, use online activities, to use internet, these are some of the issues that we are not um, <coughs> Yet. And another thing that we need to look at that here uh, is, is not the quantity that matters. Here's the, you know, the way they are persuading, maybe they are behind the, you know, curtain, but the way they are influencing, this is something that we have our traditional mindset and we often fail to recognize. Um, a few uh, things that I would, uh, you know, like to ask you that, um, you know, uh, one question, the first person who asked the question of examples. So what I found that in your, in your paper, that when you talked about a lot of issues like um, you know leadership and how women are sort of uh, recruiting um, perhaps some examples would make this a very concrete and solid you know um, argument um, for example in Southeast Asian uh, cases um, there are ample examples that in Indonesia and Malaysia particularly how chat boxes are used to recruit women um, we have no, uh, not yet that, that particular evidence here um, that chat boxes are being used by particular you know groups um, women's groups or you know other groups um so these are some of the issues that we need to talk over and over again and uh, yes uh, terrorism is no longer a men's domain remember um i think laila khaled was that famous uh, palestinian terrorist um, laila khaled uh, then the you know the way um, uh, mr rajiv gandhi was assassinated um if you watch the movie battle of algiers which was during um the fight of the algerian against french occupation so all of this shows us that women have always been a part of that and officially the first terrorist uh, in modern world was a woman who assassinated the Russian um, you know who was a Russian anarchist and she proclaimed in the court very proudly I am a terrorist you know so all of these things we often forget and we become very much you know um, uh, tied with uh, uh, patriarchal assumptions that women are powerless and women cannot do this so this is this discussion must be going on and uh, in, in case of Bangladesh uh, there may not be a lot of examples but uh, you know one example is enough to destroy the social fabric and our, you know, um, and kill some people. So this is something I, I feel that it's a, it has been a very good presentation and you need to sort of bring in a couple of more examples to, to tie up because I know you have the data with you, which you have been mentioning, but excellent presentation and we need more discussions on it. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, uh, Professor Yasmin. We appreciate your uh, kind remarks. Uh, over to Mr. Parvez Karim Abbasi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Muni. Uh, first of all, I'd keep it brief. I'm timing myself. Uh, first of all, I would uh, start by beginning. I uh, start by beginning to compliment the presenter Marzuka for a commendable presentation. It was very succinct, yet it was comprehensive. So you have managed to strike an optimal balance, and also compliments to Major General Munir sir and Bips for coming up with a very comprehensive report. Now coming back to the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, there's only two observations and many of the observations that I had wanted to make has already been reflected. Yes, as an economist, I realized that many people, because of the effect of pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a large proportion of those who are in the working class have slipped below the poverty line. And whether there's a correlation between people who are losing jobs, especially amongst the urban poor who have now migrated to the rural areas, now that is, uh, will depend on David. 
data. We can speculate, but again, that only time can tell whether there's an incidence of radicalization or there's an incidence of uh, uh, female radicalization more specifically. So that is again a function of time. We have to wait and watch. And over here, when you're talking about social resilience, the test is how good is the social security umbrella of the state in terms of uh, unemployment benefits and uh, insurance and so on and so forth. Uh, so that needs a lot of research. But the possibility of a fifth wave cannot be actually ignored because right now, because of combating uh, the economic impacts of COVID-19 and the health care that is there. So fighting terrorism, fighting radicalism, radicalization is at, is, is at an all-time low. And it's not only in Bangladesh, across the world, because the resources are finite. So again, policymakers might be taken unawares, and specifically so because when often uh, COVID-19 is being interpreted in many circles as divine wrath or divine punishment, and because of the inability of de developing vaccines or the inability and the way that uh, COVID-19 is affecting the rich and the poor, more so amongst the rich and the uh, well-to-do segments of the society, this is being interpreted as God's judgment for leading a loose life. So again, how religion is being interpreted, and it's not only Islam, I hasten to add, across different religions, uh, that also has a, might have an impact. Again, I am using the word might. There's no point for scaremongering. That's one observation. And again, further research needs to be done. And these researchers need to be supported. And another thing that we have, that tone-deaf cultural insensitivity, that is also actually contribute, that's actually get, a, adversely contributing. Just one example. A few days ago, there was a funeral, and I think all of you must have seen this, about a mother who was clad in a burqa playing cricket with her son. It's a beautiful picture. And unfortunately, in the social apps, the discussion that was uh, centered on was, oh, the lady was swathed in burqa and it is so regressive and so on and so forth. And that has set in a negative reaction because we must be careful of drawing a line that means we are countering basically female radicalization, countering violent extremism. We are preventing violent extremism, but we are not attacking religion or religious ethos. And often in our enthusiasm, I'm not saying over here, but often in our enthusiasm, often it seems that the westernized, modernized elite have something against religions, more specifically Islam. Because again, 89% of this population of Bangladesh are Muslims, and we cannot be ignorant of this fact. So when you attack, let's say, the beard or when you attack Islam or when you attack a burqa, instead of promoting mindless violence, now, again, our objective should be trained. Our, our objective should be targeted. That's about it. And there was a point about in prisons, actually, women becoming more hardened criminals. It's not only about women, it's also about men. The idea is because there is a law of large numbers, because you have like-minded people, and as a result... You, there is a propagation of this. A very good example of uh, 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 a prison system which actually de-radicalizes its inmates is in, in Saudi Arabia. Because in Saudi Arabia, the prison system is such, especially amongst female radical participants, that there is also against therapy, there is counseling. So this is a very good system which is not often advertised. But again, the problem with Bangladesh, as with many countries, is about resources. So again... I think I would like to end my observation over here. And again, compliments on a job well done. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will just take two more questions and then we will go back to the uh, presenter. Uh, Brigadier Ajaz. So you need to unmute yourself. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Shafkat, and thanks to BIFS for organizing such a beautiful seminar. Thanks to presenter. I just want to say something in the form of comments and then a question. Am I audible? Yes, yes please. Yes, sir. So I had a chance to <clears throat> serve in a law enforcement agencies regarding this particular subject. 
and my experience says that initially we worked that uh, the radicalization is spreading from madrasas or qaumi madrasas we wanted to get inside the state schools later on it is found especially if we take the some of the recent examples in bangladesh holy artisan case that not even the madrasa people male or female there are good institutions very famous institutions from where the students are getting motivated to join this kind of uh, activities so uh, presenter said that in the mosque it can be announced or some kind of motivation lecture but it's not only mosque i think it should be done in colleges schools and even in universities in the form of motivational lecture that what is the bad effect of this and how it should be stopped so this is what is my uh, even if we go around the world and what is happening we find that from very developed countries the people are joining uh, this kind of uh, forces and radicalization is spreading so i think uh, the awareness from different institutions not only mosque and madrasas uh, it should be also comprehensively practiced to stop this radicalization in bangladesh thank you right. thank you sir uh, for this round the last question from dr nadia bin tamim thank you so much uh, mazuka it was a fantastic presentation uh, mostly actually i am an entrepreneur and lalafur has covered you know the women entrepreneurs due to covid they are in a very uh, struggling situation they are at, at home they are facing uh, problems and facing uh, uh, you know struggle with the, with their business and they don't know they they have become you know sort of a aimless um, status quo now but my question is uh, regarding or sort of a, a observation about teenagers you know female teenagers in bangladesh um, uh, do you think radicalization occurs because teenagers and young adults female uh, in bangladesh they are uh, struggling to find the purpose of their lives you know mm, do you think that that could be uh, for the teenage females uh, one of the reason a uh, major reason of becoming in uh, becoming radicalization so uh, that's my observation and sort of a question to you as well and uh, we know about women uh, entrepreneurs and you mentioned about their female they are sometimes influenced by their husband but i'm uh, more concerned about uh, these um, teens these adults in growing adults so uh, what is your observation thank you so much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to question you and it was a fantastic uh, presentation thank you so much marzuka Thank, Thank you. you, ma'am. Thank you, Masuka. Uh, we'll now go back to you. Okay. Thank you, sir, uh, for giving me the floor once again. Uh, yes, I have followed all your um, uh, observations. Thank you so much for your observations. Uh, they are quite interesting. And yes, uh, sir, I do agree uh, with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Parvez, sir, uh, Parvez Abbasi. Uh, the situation uh, that we should actually uh, do something about the current situation about female radicalization before. a fifth wave hits particularly considering the pandemic um uh, you're right there is no reason for to scare monger and uh, we don't have to uh, uh, start start yelling uh, about uh, crying wolf at this situation because people are already in a situation where they're panicking over the the infection itself but we do need to be very cautious about the current situation uh, which is why the importance of counter narrative is so important right now because the more we generate counter narrative online as well as offline the more we can create awareness among people uh, and yes cultural insensitivity is a great concern here as well because while feminism itself comes under a lot of heat and there are so many perspectives like for example the jihadi feminism that i spoke of a lot of people may mistake it for being islamic feminism but it's not it's a completely different idea and uh, uh, feminism does will never promote violence and while a lot of feminists are uh, talking about uh, freedom of women and letting them wear whatever outfit they want most people still uh, uh, relate burqa and religious outfits 
to being uh, enforced or being subjugated is particularly in Islamic narrative, which is wrong because it's still a woman's choice of what she wears. If she's going to play cricket wearing a burqa, it's her choice. If she's going to wear shorts and play burqa, oh, sorry, play cricket, it's still her choice. So if we can promote the, uh, that uh, uh, idea of being liberated, we can also uh, promote the idea of liberation in a burqa and still be okay with it because it's still a woman's choice. Uh, then I would like to come uh, to uh, uh, the other observation of uh, Brigadier uh, uh, Mirza. Thank you, sir, again for your observation. I, I understand, and yes, you're completely right. When we're talking about social resilience, we can also always go to the social institu education institutions. And I think right after the Hodi Artisan attack, there were already a few workshops in place, particularly in schools that were um, uh, under the, uh, un under, uh, the army. Um, I think schools like Adonji had workshops against radicalization and terrorism. But this needs to be more uh, widespread. They need to, we need to have workshops in government schools of under, for underprivileged students. We need to have schools in private, uh, we need to have workshops like these in private schools as well. Uh, because schools are where teenagers and young youths are growing up and they are creating, a, their minds are still malleable. Their mindsets, their psyche are still impactful and they will learn from whatever we show them. And here's where I come back to um, uh, Nadia Binte Amin. Ma'am, uh, thank you so much for your question. You're right. The adolescents, particularly the children and youth, since, as I said, they are they're impressionable and they will uh, take the wrong uh, narratives of radicalization and they will get, be impacted. So, of course, this is one of the reasons uh, to why uh, they suffer from radicalization, because they have they a lot of us. We have uh, 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 this issue of having a social uh, identity disorder uh, where we are either. Uh, straight, uh, feeling strained from society and how the structure works, or we are feeling this dissociation from religion. And a lot of us try to look for a spiritual, spiritual connection. And hence, we try to look for a, a more refined religion and try to reconnect with our religious identity. So these narratives need to be proper and, uh, and from coming from correct resources. Otherwise, these adolescents, these youths will be impacted in a negative manner. And there are other reasons behind uh, being driven into radicalization, of course, women and men, youth uh, from uh, all uh, backgrounds and uh, social backgrounds and uh, cu culture. Uh, I think, and I agree with you, social identity is an issue. Uh, mental disorders and uh, unhealth like social identity and depression and frustrations are things that are so stigmatized yet now. And while any other medical issues are always taken a chance on and we always go to the doctor immediately whenever we feel, phys feel physically ill or find any problems with ourselves physically, we never address the issues that we have mentally. Uh, so depression and frustration and having social uh, identity issues or feeling religiously uh, uh, disconnected are never addressed, let alone talked about. So we need to promote the idea of talking about these issues more clearly, especially with our parents, especially with our teachers. And every time a child, uh, whether, uh, whether at the age of, uh, at, uh, 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 let's say at, at the age of nine or 10 or in their adolescence or well into their teenage years, or even a young adult, when they come to their parents with these kind of problems, they need to take this on as a serious matter and they need to address it instead of just brushing it off as something that can just go out, they can re get rid of if they take them to a vacation, let's say, suppose. So yes, I agree with you. Uh, this is a crisis and we need to address it. I hope that answers your question, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Marzika. We'll just take last two questions and then we will uh, come back to you and uh, start ending the program. So the first one goes to Nayan Salsabil. Assalamu alaikum and um, uh, your uh, your presentation is very much appreciated, Marzuka. It was very informative for all of us. So uh, I just wanted to ask something about um, the socioeconomic factors. So in the past, we've seen that socioeconomic factors have uh, directly played a part in who gets radicalized and who does not. But then after the events of 
um, the Holy Arson Bakery attack, we saw that even the very educated and well-off people are actually getting into terrorism as well, the youth especially. So uh, given that the COVID scenario, and as uh, Lala from Ma'am pointed out correctly, that greater number of women are getting unemployed, and Professor pointed out as well that greater number of people are um, falling below the poverty line uh, due to redundancy. So can we see the rise of socioeconomic factors playing a part again in the context of radicalization? And is it like emerging again? Uh, thank you. Uh, we are running a little short of time. So just two more questions and then we will have to wind up. Uh, Ms. Khadija Hassan. Um, hello, assalamu alaikum. Thank you uh, for taking my question. I have to say um, I, I love the presentation. Um, I just had two questions, like uh, uh, two queries, basically. Uh, I wanted to know about uh, how female radicalists could be more, uh, could turn into more hardened extremists in prison, uh, that perspective, if you have time, of course. And could you explain a bit more? Um, I, I, it actually already came up about jihadi feminism and its threat to Bangladesh. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, last question from Anamika Borua. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for giving me the floor. Hello, everyone. Um, so my question to Marzuka is that you have mentioned uh, one of the main factor uh, to get manipulated. I mean, when the female radicals, act, the female radicals actually get manipulated is that uh, identity crisis. So my question was, why is identity crisis such an issue when it comes to female radicalization? Thank you. Thank you. Marzuka, over to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll take the questions serially again. Uh, thank you for your questions, uh, Ms. Uh, Nahyan Salsabil. Yes, economic factors are will always come into consideration. It, it was never off the table. And particularly because of the pandemic, while a huge number of women and yes, uh, 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 Miss uh, uh, um, Lailufer Ma'am has pointed it out that uh, mostly women are losing jobs right now uh, during this recession. Women particularly are economically vulnerable again, uh, particularly for those women who have already had a, uh, a liberation, uh, particularly in the economic sector with a job or otherwise. They are feeling a bit of a discalation dis in this regard uh, and they will look for other sources of income. So frustration doubled down with uh, sexual violence and domestic violence and uh, as well as uh, the economic issue will make them want to look for jobs elsewhere and right now in this situation and we've seen it before as well uh, the uh, the extremists and terrorist outfits these outfits are always looking for women and part men even uh, who are frustrated economically who are frustrated socially and they give them solutions as to come and join with us we'll give you this amount of money and it's always very well paid they give them social uh, uh, status they give them these this uh, sustainability when it comes to economic solvency and they give them this reassurance that they will find their social identity again and they will never be frustrated because they will find a place where people like them are all together and they can share their feelings in a in a place where they're safe and where they're secured and they will be heard so yes social is social socioeconomic backgrounds will again become another issue uh, women uh, who are already well educated and are financially stable are already targets as as it is we've seen it in third generation uh, sorry third wave and fourth wave as well so uh, it's not going to change anytime soon in fact it will be something that will probably impact more uh, during this pandemic and post the pandemic thank you uh, i hope that answers your question uh, the next question is from uh, khadija hassan uh, miss khadija hassan you've asked about um the hardening of uh, women in prison. Uh, yes, women and men both get uh, get further hardened as an extremist in prison. It, and when it comes to 
the thing about prisons in Bangladesh is that we don't uh, have a separate rehabilitation or uh, or a de-radicalization process or reinst reintegration process for radicals who are not actually violent. So these radicals and extremists, non-violent extremists, they all get thrown into the same place in the same prison as the hardened extremists and terrorists are uh, are thrown in. So when they're all together in the same area, they come in each other's contact and e e easily the hardened extremists influence the nonviolent extremists and radicals. So this is how women uh, get uh, radic radicalized. I've already given the example of uh, Meghna and Mo. They were first arrested back in 2000, 2016. I, must, I can't remember correctly. I think it was 2016. They were imprisoned where they came under uh, the uh, association of Aklima, who was already a hardened extremist, and she influenced them to become more hardened. They had their own world in there, their own sisterhood. They would share the tea from the same cup. They were so close together. They would have the same Quran from which they would read. They would pray together. So easily Aklima changed their minds and made them more hardened. These are the ways that uh, make pris prisoners who are not so violent further more violent and vengeful. Uh, and the other question about female, uh, so jihadi feminism, I think I've already answered that. Uh, jihadi feminism, again, is not an imminent threat, but globally, it is already something that everybody's talking about. And I think since already previously, we've seen how the global terrorist cells, such as IS and Al-Qaeda, have already affected and uh, inspired our, uh, our local uh, terrorist cells, we can expect that something as as uh, prominent as jihadi feminism, which is already globally acknowledged, will affect us sometime. It's already showing a bit of its, uh, I would say, um, a bit of its roots already with women who are already getting independent idea and joining uh, terrorism on their own without any coercion at all. Uh, and the final question, I think, was from uh, Miss uh, Onamika Burua. I'm sorry if you could repeat your question one more time. I'd... Uh, uh, my question to you was, uh, why is identity crisis such a major right. issue or factor when it comes to fem female radicalization? Well, I think identity is something that gives us a, an idea about who we are. And not just that, it gives us a purpose of life. So when you have an identity crisis, whether social or, or religious, we are always confused about what we're going to do in our lives and we look for solutions about it. And women in particular, when they have social, uh, they have identity crisis, which we have seen in different cases, especially in, in, uh, when it comes to Bangladeshi diaspora, those women who are perhaps first generation or second generation uh, 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 um, uh, di diaspora, uh, they often struggle with their identity as a Bengali or as let's say uh, a US citizen or a, or a British citizen and they, confused, they get a cultural shock, they get confused about the religious identity, and easily they start looking for it elsewhere. And uh, this, again, this does not only work for women, this works for men as well. These things are, these things are shared. And the impacts are also different. Let's say, for example, religious outfit, there aren't much of a specific religious outfit for men. Let's say there are, well, uh, in Islam, there are the, uh, the caps that we, uh, women wear or their beards, but beards are common. Anybody can have a beard, right? But women, when it comes to religious outfits, wear burqas or hijabs like I'm wearing. That differentiates my religion with, let's say, yours. So I'm easily targeted because I'm, I'm basically wearing a hijab that makes me stand out. People in a society who are not, uh, who, where a hijab is not as common will look at you differently. And a person who was born and brought up there will start asking, why am I wearing a hijab? They'll ask uh, that if I feel related to my hijab, why are they not accepting me for who I am? So these are the social uh, issues that particularly affect women rather than men. And this is why so, uh, uh, the uh, identity crisis is such an issue for women, particularly when it comes to radicalization. I hope it answers uh, your question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marzuka, for your presentation and also for the uh, excellent manner in which you handled all the questions. We are coming to the end of the program. I think the key issue that we covered in today's webinar and in the short span of time that we had is that quite often we have a tendency to look at uh, radicalization as a broad sweep without going into the specific aspects of radicalization. 
I have personally been engaged in studying terrorism and violent extremism for nearly for a decade and a half now, or maybe slightly more than that. And during that time, I have seen how the concept and understanding of radicalization has evolved. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, or in the first decade uh, after 9-11, we had a very security-centric approach towards the understanding of terrorism and violent extremism. But since 2011 in particular, when the concept of CVE, or countering violent extremism, came into focus, we are now trying to look at terrorism, violent extremism, radicalization from a more holistic point. This is a security problem. There's no doubt about it. Uh, terrorism and violent extremism jeopardizes the national security of nation states. But when we talk about terrorism and violent extremism, we have to factor in all various other issues that have come up in today's discussion. The question of identity, the question of identity politics, the uh, question of whether we uh, can accommodate various faiths and value systems, the question of mental health, the question of uh, uh, socioeconomic issues. We are currently going through one of the gravest, I would argue, one of the gravest crises of our generation, the COVID-19 pandemic. And the post-COVID world, which has now become a very popular term, is probably going to be very different from the pre-COVID world that we knew. Or in other words, we will have to deal with the after effects of COVID for quite some time. Several speakers and uh, commentators have talked about the economic impact of COVID-19. So in this post-COVID challenging environment that is about to uh, arrive or in our lives, what will radicalization look like? So I think these are questions that we really need to ponder. And again, I would uh, say that we have to constantly do research and analysis. We have to bring in all actors into the play. And terrorism and violent extremism can only be countered and contained if there is a whole of government and whole of society approach. At BIPS and Bangladesh Center for Terrorism Research, it will be our constant endeavor to do deep dives on various aspects of terrorism and radicalization. And we will continue to organize conferences, webinars, and other events, and try to disseminate our knowledge and information. So with those brief remarks, I would now go back to uh, Ms. Celia Pasilina, the country uh, director of IFES, for her closing remarks. Thank you so much, Shafkat, and, and a special thanks, of course, to uh, our wonderful colleague Martuka for her great presentation. This was um, a really good overview of, of what, the, what the forces are behind um, women's radicalization. And, um, <clears throat> and as Shafkat very rightly pointed out, uh, it's, a, it's an issue that goes much beyond uh, the symptom of a security problem. I mean, we need to look at the causes of this and, and try to tackle them. And I think, um, you know, the, the drivers that you mentioned, um, the psychological, social, religious, economic, I mean, those are really, there, I, I can see that there's a push factor with the COVID pandemic across all those four drivers. And like Shafkat was pointing out in the very beginning, um, just because we haven't seen any big, holy artisan bakery style attacks recently doesn't mean that something is not happening below the surface. And I don't, I don't want to be all doom and gloom and, and predict bad things, but, but I, I don't think we should be complacent and think that this problem is, is um, somehow, <clears throat> you know, has been uh, addressed. Um, anywhere in the world. As I said, this is, this is really a global issue. It is, it is uh, not a Bangladeshi phenomenon. It's a, it's a global phenomenon and, and Bangladesh is absorbing influences from other countries um, and, and other countries are struggling with their own problems in the, in the same vein, even though the manifestations might be quite different. Um, so, but, but thank you for, for that presentation and also thanks to all the very distinguished um, participants who contributed with their own analysis. I mean, I, I learned uh, something new today. I did not know that uh, prisons in Saudi Arabia were so advanced in terms of countering female radicalization. I had no idea. 
so um, there, there was a lot that I learned today and that I, that I really will, will think about for a long time. So thanks very much to Marjika, to Bips, um, um, Shafkat and, and uh, General Munir as well um, for hosting this. And I look forward to seeing all of you soon and, and talking about this further. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Uh, we have now come to the end of the webinar. On behalf of our uh, institute and all my colleagues, once again, uh, warm thanks to our partners in IFES, particularly Celia and our other IFES colleagues who are here with us today. And uh, also to our presenter, Ms. Marzuka bin Gavzal, for uh, her excellent presentation and her remarks. And a special thanks to all our participants uh, we are particularly grateful to you for being with us this afternoon. And many of you are uh, regular associates of BIPs. You have been supporting us over the years by coming to various events and so on. Uh, we really appreciate your help. Uh, we will continue with uh, other webinars on other topics and we will continue to keep you informed. And inshallah, hopefully very soon, we will be able to organize physical events as well, like we did in pre-COVID times. So with that, uh, thank you again for your participation. Please follow our social media channels and website for further updates. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Good afternoon.